Hello everyone and welcome to this video which is in our human game series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are taking a look at some games from the Women Candidates quarter-final between Anna Muzichuk and Humpi Kuneru. Um, it was a fantastic match and um, very interesting as well from a theoretical point of view. Um, what uh, Muzichuk did against the Petrov was very, very impressive. So let's uh, dive in and have a look. We're going to be focusing mainly on the last game of the regular match. And Muzichuk needed to win it to level the match and take it into tie breaks. Well, and whenever you're playing 1e4 and your opponent's playing the Petrov, that's not an easy thing to do. But um, in her first white game, Muzichuk had built up a, a dangerous looking attacking position. And although uh, engine analysis had, uh, had shown that the attack was in fact unsound, it obviously felt like a good basis for a must-win game, and uh, Muzichuk repeated the same opening. So it was uh, e4, e5, knight f3, knight f6, the Petrov, and now d4. Knight takes e4, d takes e5, d5, and knight d2. And um, White's uh, system here is simply to, um, well, you set up a, um, a pawn on e5 that... Uh, um, covers a couple of the kingside squares. You're going to try and swap off that knight on e4 and then try and get a, a sort of a typical attacking structure against the uh, the black kingside. Uh, and here, Kunero repeated the move that she played uh, in the uh, the first game where she was black, and that was queen d7. And uh, this ingenious move, it was first played by Fabiano Caruana, big Petrov expert, against Vichigov in uh, 2018. And the idea is simply that, um, you know, after an exchange of, uh, of knights on e4, d takes e4, then um, after queen takes d7, we're not having to take with a king on d8, uh, but we play knight takes d7. And actually this um, uh, pawn on e5 is, um, well, in a little bit of trouble in actual fact. So um, uh, queen d7 just uh, actually keeps the knight on e4 a little bit longer and forces white to make a, a bit more effort to get rid of it. So uh, bishop d3 was played by um, uh, Musichuk, and that's one of the main moves. Uh, there's also um, a bishop to e2, and uh, knight b3 was uh, an engine choice uh, a number of times, but uh, didn't lead to, uh, to anything particularly exciting. So bishop d3, knight to c5, and bishop e2. And so at the cost of a tempo, we've managed to get that, um, that knight away from, uh, from e4. But it finds quite a nice uh, square on e6. Uh, quite um, a, um, a traditional uh, square in these sort of structures. You've got a pawn on, um, on e5 here, um, and then you just put a knight on e6 in front of it. You know, the knight can, uh, can look to come out to, uh, to d4 or to f4, for example, um, and it's, you know, nice and invulnerable there. So here White's got um, a little bit of a choice. Muzichuk played the, um, the most uh, obvious and natural move, which is uh, castles. Um, in my engine matches, Dragon also had a look at knight f1, which was quite interesting. I mean, actually, what you're trying to do is attack this um, uh, this uh, d5 pawn um, before black's castled and has got all the firepower to defend it. And, uh, well, we got some pretty wild games here. b6 was a new idea from Stockfish. Knight e3, d4, knight f5, knight c6, bishop b5, bishop c5, castles bishop b7, a3. So we've got some sort of uh, fight around this uh, d4 pawn, and White's intending uh, b2 to b4 just to uh, attack that bishop on c5. So g6, knight h6, bishop f8, rook e1, castles. And uh, yeah, really uh, quite a wild game. Um, yeah, in um, my engine game continued just a little bit longer, just a pawn sacrifice on the g-file, takes, takes, rook g8. And, uh, you know, black had uh, decent compensation for the, uh, for the pawn here. I mean, we've got this uh, rook and uh, bishop converging on here, and this knight's just uh, a tiny bit uh, anxious about what it's got itself into. So knight f1, um, definitely interesting to look at. But um, Muzichuk played um, castles, which is the, um, the main move. And now bishop e7 from black. I have to say that, you know, just from my point of view, loving my bishops as I do, that uh, knight f4 would be something uh, I'd definitely be, uh, be looking at longingly during a game. Just, uh, yeah, you're going to win the, uh, the bishop pair in this way, but you're wasting a lot of time. I mean, actually, of course, this, um, this knight has played, uh, has gone from f6 to e4 to c5 to e6, and now you're going to play f4 takes e2. You know, something's got to be... Um, uh, a little bit wrong with that. I mean, nothing too wrong, but uh, knight b1 was the engine move. Very nice. 
Um, and you're actually just going to try and uh, line up with um, uh, rook d1 and c4 and knight c3. I mean, the Indians were surviving this as black, so it's not um, a bad, bad line. But uh, yeah, it was clear that, you know, white was, uh, was more comfortable there. Just got to get uh, over the trauma of losing your bishop pair. So bishop b7, rook e1, and castles. And knight f1. Um, I mean, there, there, there are other ideas. I mean, for example, the engines were quite keen on the, on c4, but um, I'm not particularly, I have to say. This uh, reminds me very much of uh, an opening structure that you get in the Queen's Gambit Accepted. It's the line uh, d4, d5, uh, c4, d take, c4, e4, and then e5. And uh, I ended, always ended up having bad experiences with, uh, with this as white. You know, I had my uh, um, a pawn on, um, on e5 here, but um, you know all the um, the squares around that always ended up getting uh, you know uh, used by black for uh, for great activity. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I don't think it's that much, and uh, the engines didn't manage to make that much of it. And uh, obviously in a must-win game, that's not at all what you want. And uh, Wuzichuk just keeps the position tight at the back, and knight f1. And we're still following the first game that uh, these players played out in Wuzichuk's first white game in the match. C5 from uh, Canero makes sense, you know, grab some uh, central territory. Um, knight G3. Um, I did wonder, actually, you know, about playing the move um, Bishop D3 as well. Uh, maybe vaguely interesting. The idea is uh, if um, Black ever plays uh, the move uh, uh, C4, then the bishop comes round to F5. Might get some pressure that way. But um, uh, in general, you do have to say that uh, if you're going to get a piece on F5, the most dangerous one will be the knight. And that's what Musichuk is going for with uh, knight f5. And here, um, uh, in this game, Muzichuk, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Kuneru varied first. So in the first game, uh, Kuneru had played the move bishop f8, which is very natural. I mean, it's quite intuitive to keep that dark squared bishop. Um, but actually, the engines don't see knight takes c7 as a particular threat. And, you know, if you consider that white's played knight b1 to d2 to f1 to g3 to f5, it would be a bit... A bit of a shame, really, just to exchange it for a, for a dark squared bishop that's moved once. And, you know, moving the, um, the bishop back to f8 does give white access to, um, to this um, uh, dangerous g5 square. You know, so um, either the bishop can move there or the knight. So, yeah, you know, probably you feel that um, uh, you might play bishop f8 eventually, but probably you don't need to immediately. Um, and the game continued c3, knight c6, bishop d3, queen c7. And here actually Muzichuk sort of overdid it a bit. Although, uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, intuitively, I mean, I'm just 100% with her. I have to say uh, uh, what she played was very natural. I mean, the engines uh, just thought that um, uh, instead of bishop g5, which is what she played, that um, the bishop c2 was uh, would be best, just aiming for a slow build-up. And you're just claiming, basically, you know, that you've got um, um, a strong pawn on um, on e5. You've got a great knight on f5, you know, which is hard to drive away. Um, it's protected by the um, the bishop on c2. And um, a move like g6 is met by um, knight h6 check. And uh, maybe this knight can come round, you know, g4 into f6. And, um, well, in my games, uh, this worked out quite well when uh, Stockbridge was playing white and uh, Lila was playing black. I'll just give you one example just to show. Um, C4, H3, just uh, nice and slow. Um, actually, uh, Lila played uh, this very uh, unusual plan, just moving the rook to B6, trying to, um, to tie down this B2 pawn. Um, H6, bishop B3, actually just uh, ended up getting the, uh, the rook attacked. Knight C5 and knight H4. Uh, just sacrificing this e5 pawn, queen f3, and uh, yeah, I mean, actually, you can already see that uh, there's a lot of danger here for uh, for black. I've uh, I've got threats like uh, bishop takes c5, bishop h6. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the game carried on a little bit more. Queen g4, g6, bishop d2, knight e4, knight takes h6, um, king g7, bishop e3, and uh, you know, it was really. Black had a very difficult defensive task, and Leela didn't manage to uh, to hold that. So I guess that um, you know probably if Canero had repeated that something like this, I guess would have been um, uh, um, Musichuk's uh, idea. Um, just to show you quickly the game. The game went bishop g5, after which the engines think that White is almost lost. It's really weird. I mean, it looks so natural, right, to get uh, this big attacking structure, but um, Black's just uh, very very solid and. Uh, yeah, this pawn on e5 is uh, is hanging. And uh, this uh, great-looking attack that uh, Muzzichuk went for could have been refuted, uh, not by knight e7, 
which was played in the game, but by the move knight e5, which um, just covers stuff in a in a somewhat more active way. Um, we're just actually looking. Black's just looking to um, uh, to take the um, uh, the bishop on d3 and then grab the um, uh, this hanging f5 knight. Um, and uh, well, what can you say? Um, the best that the engines came up with was queen e2 takes knight e7 check. King h8, knight f7, king g7. Needs a bit of uh, fancy stepping around, but uh, essentially what you just get to, this is the key point, that uh, queen takes d3 would allow queen takes c6. Um, after rook e3, you play c4, and it's just a great position for black. Two pieces for the um, uh, for the rook, and well-placed ones as well. For example, um, this bishop is coming round to c5 when f2 is weak. So, I mean, actually, that was a huge moment in the match because this was the second game after Conero had won the first game. So that would have been 2-0 up in a four-game match, you know, basically impossible to come back from there. But um, Conero played knight e7 and, uh, well, we got this um, uh, lovely uh, little uh, perpetual, queen h5. Um, yeah, knight takes e6 was, was possibly uh, a, little, a little something worth punting. Um, the engines were still saying it was a draw, but... Uh, uh, plenty of opportunities to get uh, perpetual check there, but uh, probably uh, Muzichuk felt that uh, yeah uh, she got away with this one, so yeah let's not uh, risk it and uh, stay fighting in the match, and uh, so this ended up as a as a draw by perpetual. So that was the first game, um, but uh, in fact uh, Kunera was the first to deviate, um, and obviously yeah you know been a slightly uncomfortable experience even if the engine uh, liked Black's position. Uh, during the attack, so, oops, good lord, played the move, not that, giving you a sneak preview there, but the move knight c6. So, um, b3 was played, and this was really, you know, I looked at it and I really scratched my head in puzzlement, um, but the more I looked at it, um, the more I understood it, and the more impressed I was, actually deeply impressed. Um, it's a fantastic idea in a must-win situation. Um, you know, the idea is not to develop the bishop on b2. Um, that's, uh, that's not the idea. Um, the idea simply is that, um, you know, if you play a move like, um, for example, uh, c3, which is very, very natural, then that gives black the opportunity to play something like d4. And the lines become very concrete. And you could imagine that you could analyze this in quite a bit of depth with your uh, engine beforehand and find some pretty concrete ways to um, uh, to reach um, equality. Simply, you know, with C3, you're giving the opportunity to engage quickly. Um, this move, um, uh, B3, this uh, doesn't give Black any opportunity to engage quickly. And the idea is simply to restrict Black's queenside play. So, um, you know, Black might want to play the move C4, for example. That's held back by B3. And you see that uh, on the next move, Black plays the move A6. And then we play the move A4 and restrict that queenside play. And um, uh, in the meantime, you know, White's got plenty of ideas for uh, attacking. We've got ideas like uh, H4 to H5 to uh, H6, for example. Um, and um, the fact that you've played b3, which dissuades c4, means you might be able to play bishop to d3. Um, but essentially what you're doing, you're, you're sort of staying out of range of, uh, of anything concrete that black might have prepared. And, you know, from that point of view, it's a fantastic choice in a must-win situation. And if you're looking at the rest of the position, you know, the engines do think that this is about equal. You know, I mean, they think it's uh, that Black's doing all right here. But um, if you look at it from a human point of view, um, you know, we've got um, um, a great pawn on e5. We've got a knight on f5, which is really hard to uh, to move away for uh, for Black. I mean, these are all typical things that can lead to uh, attacks. So I really think that, uh, you know, in this game, uh, Muzitruk really did a fantastic job of, um, uh, of building something up that would be, um, you know, possible where it's really possible to play for a win there. So, um, you know, what did, um, um, I mean, what does the engine want? Actually, the engine wanted something that, um, uh, that is quite, yeah, not completely intuitive. It wanted to play the move queen to c7. Um, which feels odd, really, because, you know, white could play knight takes c7 and then you've wasted a move with a queen. But, you know, the engine just isn't concerned at all about that sort of stuff. Um, doesn't consider that b3 is uh, really such a fantastic tempo. And it's very happy to see that knight on f5 gone. 
Um, so, yeah, you know, um, uh, I imagine that, uh, you know, after Queen C7, that uh, Muzichuk would have just played something like um, H4, for example, or Bishop D2, and just played very much uh, as in the game. Um, the idea of Queen C7, uh, in actual fact, is that um, Black wants to get counterplay, and that counterplay is going to come with C4 and Knight C5. And then you're opening up the line of the bishop on uh, the knight on F5, and hopefully managing to get rid of that piece. And, uh, you know, this knight can come round, back round to e4 again. And, uh, um, and when you're playing c4, you're stopping. You're taking some, uh, some space around from the, um, from the uh, white pieces, stopping the, um, um, the bishop from, uh, from getting to d3. And, um, you know, why is c4 more possible with a queen on c7? It's just because you're opening up the line of the rook on the queen on d1. So, um, yeah, you know, that was what the engine was wanting uh, consistently on the next few moves. But it's not, it's not really human intuitive. So, again, you know, if uh, you've planned this as a surprise, this move B3, um, yeah, it would be, you, you could, you know, reasonably assume that, um, uh, that your human opponent might, uh, you know, not actually think of playing the queen to C7 whilst the threat of knight takes C7 is still in the, um, uh, in the position. And what uh, Kunera did was, was very, very natural. It's just um, b6 and, uh, you know, you're going to develop the, um, the, the, the light squared bishop to b7 and, uh, you know, get, get this guy uh, activated as well. The only thing about it is that, you know, you could say that, uh, you know, putting the bishop on this diagonal, it means that this knight on f5, it's quite amazing. It's not protected by anything, but it's completely impervious to being chased away. And putting the bishop off that diagonal is not really going to help. Um, so, yeah. You know, um, and uh, you know what you do notice as well is that um, in all the variations now, um, White starts getting some good attacking possibilities. Now, Muzichuk played h4, and you'll never see me criticising a move like that. March of the Rook's pawn. This uh, pawn is going all the way to h6 to weaken all these kingside dark squares. You know, I mean that's uh, that's a really good idea. But um, the engines were also looking at another move, and uh, it's interesting in the sense that you really start to see storm clouds uh, gathering because, um, yeah, bishop d3 was, um, was one of uh, uh, the ideas. And then we got some, some crazy games here. Um, bishop f8. Uh, the idea, funnily enough, is that if you go c4, um, I'm going to take on e7 and go bishop f1. And um, um, the idea is that uh, actually with these moves b3 and a4, you've, uh, you've gained the possibility of going bishop a3 into d6, which is pretty cool. You know, it's uh, quite interesting, quite interesting uh, little idea there. But um, uh, let's have a look at bishop f8, c3, rook e8, rook a2, bringing the rook into play there. Another nice uh, little uh, uh, advantage of having played uh, a4 and b3. d4, knight g5, and then things really start to happen. Takes, takes, dc, knight takes g7. This is a game uh, dragon against stockfish. You can always rely on dragon to find uh, these sort of, um, yeah, nice attacking setups. And you can normally rely on stockfish to, uh, to hold them somehow. Um, the big threat is bishop takes h7, and the queen on d7 is uh, hanging. So rook e d8, I love this move. It's protecting the queen on d7, so protecting uh, um, against this, uh, this um, uh, bishop takes h7 idea. But of course, it's putting the rook arm prize to the bishop on g5, so quite hilarious. Um, but rook e3, bishop g7, check anyway. Queen h5, bishop f6, queen e6, queen g5, and the king escapes. And um, we get this type of position where, yeah, you know... Uh, White's got uh, rook and two pawns for knight and bishop, but those knight and bishop are pretty good. Got some good squares and also some uh, some uh, weak queenside pawns to attack there. So, yeah, I mean, the engine basically thought that this was um, around even, but, yeah, you know, still a, a very complicated position for human players, I think, as well. So, you know, already you're starting to see that those basic raw materials that Muzichuk has uh, set up from the opening, um, you know, uh, a pawn on e5... Um, and uh, a knight on f5, um, and the fact that, you know, obviously that means that a, a black knight has been moved away from the immediate defense of the king's side, you know, that's giving attacking possibilities, and, you know, the fact that uh, an engine can defend against it uh, with black doesn't necessarily mean that you'd enjoy uh, defending against that as black yourself in a, um, in, in, in a, in a game in a tense situation, a must-win situation like this.
So h4 played by Muzichuk, bishop f8 now, and bishop d2. And again, you know, this is really clever play um, in a must-win situation. Because, you know, as soon as you go c3, black goes d4. You know, so you just develop with bishop d2, and you're just, um, you know, waiting to see what, um, what black does. And here I think that um, uh, Kunero played very natural human moves. But uh, this is where the engine uh, might have helped you if you could have prepared, you know, this uh, position before. Uh, because the engine wants to play rook b8. Now, it's not that this is like easy equality or anything, but it's a very concrete idea. The idea is that black's going to play b5 and c4 and really go for this uh, counterplay. And you are keeping this bishop on c8 to um, uh, patrol this uh, c8 h3 diagonal. And, uh, you know, whenever I see something like this, it always reminds me of uh, something that the uh, American Grandmasters, uh, Robert Byrne and William Lombardi, um, noted a number of times in their annotation separately from each other. Uh, but simply that, um, uh, yeah, you know, a, a bishop has the, um, you know, the unusual characteristic that can often be developed on its uh, initial square. You see that a lot in the Samish King's Indian, you often see the bishop staying on f1, but, you know, ready to come into play all the time. And, um, well, here in actual fact, it's probably one of those situations where the bishop on c8 would have been better developed than, the, uh, than putting it on, uh, on b7. So, um, um, well, we got some, some lovely sharp games. I mean, bishop d3 played. The engine um, just um, looking to tee up. Really just wants to keep the bishop there and start moving. g6, knight h2. In we go. We are aiming for knight g4. And then these squares are going to be toast. And, uh, well, I mean, the variations are just completely crazy. Uh, um, takes, takes is a pretty promising sacrifice. Knight g4, just uh, ignoring the attack there and... Uh, um, threatening knight f6 check bishop g7 takes takes ef check and um, yeah you know the engine said that uh, this was equal and they agreed to draw in my engine games you know uh, but white's carrying on with uh, with bishop f4 and uh, you know um, f7's coming in to clear and the bishop's coming into e5 the king's weak um, I don't know I mean uh, it's just a crazy position as far as I'm concerned and uh, yeah wouldn't necessarily want uh, you know uh, if I played this as uh, as black in a game, I wouldn't necessarily think that I was doing fine. Um, the engine also looked at uh, d4, knight g4, king h8. But, you know, this is obviously, you know, high level defense here. And uh, knight d6 takes, takes, and then this move b4 is very important. Very interesting to see, you know, how this move rook b8 from black and then this very concrete pushing of these um, uh, queenside pawns um, whilst keeping the bishop on c8 not developing it you know is, is the best way to attack white's position and uh, actually the engines thought that a draw by repetition in this position was best but well i mean you can see the the complexity that's in the position there and um yeah you know a move like rook b8 you wouldn't necessarily yeah, I mean, uh, it's the sort of thing that you, you, you definitely do after home analysis. But yeah, at the board, it's not really easier to see that you're, you're in less danger playing this concretely than if you play bishop b7. It's just that black is kind of, you know, with a move like rook b8, you know, threatening to gain space and squeeze the white pieces, you force white to attack maybe before he's completely ready. A move like bishop b7 is much more general and just gives white time to, uh, um, to get more and more pieces uh, into the attack. And that's what happens, h5. <clears throat> and now, um, well, you can make a, you know, a couple of questions about uh, some of the moves, you know, small queries. But uh, now I think we get the first serious misstep, and this one's from Black. Um, what the engine wanted, the engine uh, does not uh, want to allow you to play the move h5 to h6. It does not like the idea of having weak dark squares. And to be honest, I think this is a, a, a general thing that you see with engines they um uh they're generally trying to stop that uh, rook's pawn uh, before it reaches h6 i certainly remember that alpha zero uh yeah kind of the uh, originator of this uh march of the rook's pawn is just as a long-term strategical uh um idea um always tried to stop the h pawn early it never allowed it to uh, to come around to uh, to h6 um, and, you know, the other, engi other engines are, are not quite as extreme as that, but they do generally uh, stop it. And h6 is the engine choice. And I mean, in some ways, it's a little bit of an odd move, right? Because uh, it makes it harder to get rid of this knight on f5 because, uh, you know, uh, uh, g6 will leave this h6 pawn hanging. 
but um, yeah, it does you know sort of give White uh, the task of uh, of finding a new plan because uh, that plan of weakening the dark squares and then maneuvering your knights towards it isn't in there anymore. And uh, you know, often to be honest, uh, you know, cutting out an opponent's plan, forcing him to think again, is uh, certainly in human over the board players can be a very powerful uh, way of playing. Um, yeah, the engine uh, sort of shimmies around with its king here, just uh, um, calculating, um, uh, you know, what can I do with, uh, um, what do I need to, to have in order to survive a sacrifice on h6. And um, yeah, I mean, bishop h6 was uh, apparently not so much according to the engine, although, yeah, you know, I'm seeing a, a reasonable amount of danger here for uh, for black. I'm not necessarily that happy. Um um, in my engine games, uh, Stockfish against Dragon, um, actually Stockfish played uh, something really interesting there, just uh, B4, just trying to loosen up the um, uh, the dark squares. And also, you know, if this pawn were to take on B4, then um, we've got a, a lovely secure uh, D3 square for the bishop. So uh, C4 was played by Dragon, not taking the pawn, just trying to uh, restrict the white pieces. And then we get something like B5. And yeah, this is just, you know, a very, very unclear position. But um, yeah, you certainly don't feel that, um, that white doesn't have chances here. You know, white's got loads of, uh, of interesting chances here. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, the game was just absolutely what uh, Muzichuk wanted for, the, uh, for a must-win game. But 97 was played, and now um, a slight... Um, yeah, slight inaccuracy in return from Muzichuk, although still, you know, a move, a very good move. Um, yeah, knight d6 was what the engines uh, wanted. Um, because, you know, if you're just going to get the bishop pair, and if bishop c6, we just go knight g5, which is really strong. I mean, we're attacking uh, f7, and, uh, you know, our bishops are, uh, are coming in. It's really dangerous. So the engines were looking at knight c6, takes, takes, knight g5, getting rid of that strong knight. Um, and then bishop g4 and rook e6. And uh, yeah, um, knight c6, g3. And um, well, it might not look like enormous amounts, but um, you know, white does have a, a nice little uh, um, series of advantages. First of all, the, the, um, uh, the two bishops, then um, a space advantage. Um, and secondly, you know, this, this king on, uh, on h8 is uh, rather uh, restricted. And these um, minor pieces of blacks don't really have much scope. And uh, actually, this was just two wins for white in my engine games, which, um, you know, that, that's not a, 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 that doesn't necessarily say that it's 100% winning. But it does show that, you know, even if an engine like Stockfish can't hold it, um, then, uh, yeah, this is obviously a pretty serious advantage. So that was um, um, even stronger. But what Muzichuk did was, I think, was, you know, very consistent with her goals. Uh, she was going for the attack here. And, um, um, yeah, keeping a knight on f5 is, you know, still a very strong idea. And actually that exchange of knights has only helped um, white here because, uh, you know, white had a lot of pieces, a lot of barriers to getting this uh, queen on d1 active on the king side. But now we're just going to go bishop g4 and bring the queen round f3 to g3. So actually this exchange of knights is uh, strange enough, you know, for attacks normally you say exchanges are good, but this is actually freed white's position. It's going to give white a lot more power to get the queen involved. So h6 was still what the engines wanted, you know, stop that pawn. But uh, Cunero played king h8 and, um, well, h6 would have been interesting here too. But um, bishop g4 was played by uh, Muzichuk and this is a very strong move as well. Um, d4 and now h6 g6 knight g3 and I mean you know if you just look at this position you know from move 12 I mean it's pretty clear that uh, um, that white's achieved an awful lot here I mean we've got these um, these weak dark squares we've got this um, h pawn on uh, on h6 here which is really restricting that king on h8 so you know long term lots of variations if there's ever anything where lines get opened and there's something with the back rank that king is going to be weak and that's what you notice, you know, that's the, the power of the h6 pawn. It's not about, um, oh, we're going to mate the opponent. It's about, it's a long-term strategical game. And, and lots of variations that you're going to be analysing from now, you're going you're gonna to see that if that pawn was on h2, it would be equal. With a pawn on h6, it's a win for white. It's that, you know, amount of difference. And I mean, that was the, you know, 
that's really the amazing thing that uh, that Alpha Zero brought to it. It, it wasn't uh, it wasn't that nobody had ever pushed a rook's pawn before. Simon Williams would definitely tell you that. But the idea of using uh, a rook's pawn just lodged deep into uh, into Black's throat as a long term strategical game, um, you know, that was the and using it in like so many different positions that was really what um what alpha zero brought uh new to uh to the game and what you're seeing now you know in all the engines and in a lot of elite games as well um but yeah you know so we've already got this and now actually what white is aiming for um it's uh quite beautiful there are two possibilities i mean we could just go bishop f3 swap off these um uh light squared bishops um, and then afterwards, we're just going to bring the knight round e4 into f6. That's one possibility. Uh, the other idea is just to bring the knight into e4. Black plays bishop e4. We take back with a rook, two bishops, and then off we go. We're happy. So, you know, this is a very difficult position for black. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, obviously, Canero realized this and decided that, uh, OK, I can't let this happen. I've got to start fighting back and play this very sharp move c4. Um, I think it's you know it's one of those things that's it's a um, it's a really good move uh, it's um it, it's a bad move uh, in actual fact objectively but it's you know based on a perfect understanding of the the difficulties of the position um, I mean the engines managed to hold this um, but not in any, any way that I feel you know <laughs> happy recommending you know rook c8 we go bishop g5 here uh, exploiting this um, uh, this pin here. Um, if you go bishop e7, I'll just take, take, go bishop f3, takes, takes, and knight e4. And, you know, we've got basically everything that we were talking about. You know, this knight is aiming at either for um, uh, for f6 or for d6. And uh, the engines don't consider this to be winning, um, but the evaluations are very close to it. And in actual fact, again, all of my white games from here ended up as engine wins. Even Stockfish couldn't hold this as black. So shows how awkward this position is. And um, if you go bishop g5, rook e8, then white's actually got this possibility of playing c4. Um, why do you play c4? Well, you're just stopping any black counterplay from happening. No c5 to c4 anymore. And I mean, I could really imagine that, you know, when you spot this as black, you just think, well, come on, I'm not doing this. This is just, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm killing myself here. Um, in actual fact, the engines managed to hold this. You know, they sort of feel that uh, Black's position is solid enough to um, uh, to make it, but it's in all sorts of bizarre ways, uh, you know, which I'm, uh, I'm not going to trouble you with. But, you know, essentially the engines feel that it was still possible to, um, um, to hold on and to wait and uh, not to do anything crazy. But, uh, you know, from the human point of view, mwah, yeah. I can thoroughly understand c4. Uh, the key point is, though, is that um, you know with c4 you're you're really um, you, you're well you're trying to break up white structure, but you're also breaking up your own solid structure. And um, um, what Muzichuk spots beautifully is that um, actually there's uh, um, there's another invasion channel that's been opened, and uh, it turns out that you know black can't really um, win this pawn uh, this pawn here without losing this pawn on b6. And, uh, well, losing this pawn on b6, it's just a, another entry channel into black's position. And, you know, it's an open file. I mean, once after um, black had to play rook c4, rook b6, now we've got our open file. It means we can get to the back rank. It means that the weakness of this king, restricted by this great pawn on h6, suddenly becomes a tactical factor in all sorts of positions. And, um, yeah, you know, again, this position with a pawn on h2, wouldn't be great for black, but it wouldn't be uh, critical. And this one's actually just lost. Um, so bishop c5 and rook b3. And, uh, you know, black is in an awful state. I mean, the bishop on b7 is on prees, um, or attacked by the rook, rather. Um, knight on e6 is pinned to this guy, which means that bishop g5 is imminent, coming into f6. And we've also got ideas afterwards, like um, uh, bishop f3, swap off that light squared bishop, and then bring that knight in through e4 into the f6 square um and on top of that this rook on c4 is loose which uh ha you know is a tactical problem in many ways to be honest i'm, I'm quite amazed that uh um you know i think real testament to uh Canero's, um uh, uh resilience under pressure that uh she didn't just lose straight away here because that is completely possible um bishop b7 keeping it tight at the back at least um stopping a bishop from coming into uh to g5 here Knight e4, 
Um, actually, the uh, the engines were hugely keen to play the move bishop takes e6 because they considered that having forced this pawn structure on the king's side for uh, for black was incredibly good for um, uh, for white. Um, and yeah, we're going to see uh, probably an, an even, a really nice example later about why that's the case. Um, I mean, this is one of those things where, you know, you realise that this is good for white, but, you know, how good, you know, uh, uh, giving up light square bishop, has that really made a big difference? But actually, you know, for an engine, this is already, uh, you know, plus four or plus five. Um, and uh, the idea is that, um, you know, we're just threatening uh, moves like um, uh, like knight d6, uh, followed by rook d4. You've got stuff like bishop g5. And if you go bishop e4, rook e4, rook c4, very hard to hold the the d form because we go bishop a5 and chase away the rook from the protection of the d8 of the d4 square the other idea is if bishop c5 we've got this lovely deflection bishop b4 and if you take um i think it's this one isn't it rook e takes d4 with um well let's just say uh this is not <laughs> this is not going to end well uh with uh, this rook uh on the on this line so um, that would have been really good. Um, but what Muzicic did as well was very, very strong. So um, we just went back like this and uh, Muzicic played the move knight e4 uh, takes and rook takes. And um, yeah, I mean, we're just uh, we've got all sorts of ideas here. Having got rid of the um, of the light squared bishop, um, we've got definite possibilities of invasion on b7, which is, you know, uh, very, very strong along the second rank there. So um, uh, Conero played uh, queen c6. And um, here, um, yeah, here uh, White's play was just a, a little bit slow. I mean, when you compare it to, to superhuman uh, standards, at, at least what uh, what you see is that um, um, you know, for an uh, uh, if you were playing against uh, a, a superhuman engine and it was black, you'd be bringing this position uh, a little bit closer towards uh, conceivably able to draw its standards, you know, but uh, different to uh, human standards in that, of course. I mean, again, what the engine wants is the move bishop takes c6. If um, f takes c6, we go queen g4 uh, takes. We just end up picking up, picking up this uh, this d pawn. And um, uh, if you go queen takes c6, um, then rook b7. You get the rook straight away in, into the uh, into the b file. And uh, actually, this just turned out to to be a complete disaster for um, uh, for uh, for black. We ended up in um, in this sort of um, uh, ending. To swap off the queens and uh, again this pawn on uh, h6 turned out to be um, rather sad for the black king on g8 um, this was how one of my engine games went rook g7 rook a7 rook a6 g3 rook takes e6 and a couple of extra pawns and still you know uh, lots of possibilities of attacking this h7 pawn it was just uh, completely hopeless for um, for black so, you know, bishop b6 would have been um, a little bit quicker. Um, you would have been a tempo quicker, basically, uh, compared to uh, to the game. So queen f3 was played by him, which took, again, a very, very good move. King g8, bishop takes c6. Yeah, and now the engine wanted to play um, queen takes c6. And, uh, well, I mean, basically, you've just got kind of an extra move, uh, king g8, really, um, to protect the pawn on f7, which is definitely going to help. And the queen on f3 looks great, but um, yeah, somehow um, it was much better on d1, where it was attacking the d4 pawn. Yeah, I don't know, very hard. Uh, you know, I'm only understanding this sort of stuff when I'm looking at it at the engine and looking at uh, the games that uh, that arise in the heat of battle. Very hard to uh, to understand. But um, yeah, I mean, this was uh, the, the line that the engines thought was um, was the best. Actually, what was just basically happening was that um, um, we're getting the D pawn and the uh, and the A pawn, but Black's managing to swap off an awful lot of stuff. Um, now, it was a pretty grim and de depressing defence. Uh, essentially, if your name was Stockfish, then you were going to hold it as black. And if it wasn't, then it was going to be lost. That was the basic, uh, uh, the basic result of that. But, you know, obviously, from an um, from, um, uh, objective point of view, it's clear that White's just been um, a little bit slow. And I think it's, um, it's kind of due to the fact of uh, um, probably both players were misassessing slightly um, what you really wanted to capture on E6 with. And uh, for the engine, it was always the queen. Whereas I think the human players were thinking F takes E6, stop a rook from, uh, from getting into B7, which, to be honest, I understand perfectly as well.
Um, the thing about f takes e6 is that um, it weakens the um, uh, the black king side, but yeah, it weakens it in a, in a rather unexpected way, or rather, you exploit an unexpected factor, um, which uh, you know I didn't see, but uh, of course I saw when uh, uh, when my engine started analysing it, and this was the move queen d3. Um, queen d3 doesn't look so bad. I mean, it sort of feels like you're uh, lining up on the d4 pawn, but it's more than that because after rook takes, you're going rook g4. And that is the weakness that you're exploiting. The fact that black has played the move uh, f takes e6 means that this g6 pawn is weak. And that is what we are um, exploiting uh, in this way. And king f7, it follows it. It carries on a little bit because you've got to see a little bit more. Takes, takes, rook a5, and then this gorgeous move, queen g3. And the idea here is that, um, well, we're still... Um, attacking this pawn on g6 so breakthrough sacks are still possible but the idea is to bring rook f3 check to attack this king on f7 and uh, well it carries on but um, it basically ends up being carnage for uh, for black but um, yeah I mean that was the the real drawback to um, uh, to playing f takes e6 that we can switch our attention onto the g6 pawn but yeah I don't know kind of hard to uh, um, hard to visualize it's not quite where you know you, you're bringing pieces to the king side somehow so switching the angle is just a, a little bit hard to spot but what musty Chuck does is very very simple um i mean uh, and very strong as well i mean you're attacking the uh, the e6 pawn with the um with the queen and um what you're simply going to try and do is to go after this d pawn by attacking it with rooks with major pieces so Conero does actually what you have to do uh, as a human player which is uh, just keep on trying to create mess and uncertainty and disruption and rook takes c2 does that takes a pawn and attacks the bishop on d2 and bishop c5 and now this is one of those bizarre moments uh, because uh, you know looking at um, uh, at the evaluation uh, uh, chart for this game somewhere you see that um, the white evaluation just goes vroom like that um, but you know playing through the moves uh, just or um, uh, well, thinking about the moves rather than the game I, I couldn't quite work out you know where had that happened you know what on earth had happened and strangely enough it was at this moment because um, Muzichuk played the unbelievably natural move bishop g5 preparing to bring the bishop into f6 and that apparently threw away all of white's um yeah plus six worthy advantage um well we'll see why and try and understand why but it is quite incredible i mean again i would never guess i'm pretty sure that uh, um that whatever time i had left in the game i would whap, whip out uh, bishop g5 um, but again, you know, the key thing is, is that the, that the engine is focusing on this new weakness of the g6 pawn that was caused by f takes e6. And OK, we didn't play queen d3, rook g4, but instead of bishop g5, we can play rook f4 uh, with the idea of coming into f6 and attacking on g6. Um, if you go rook f8, then I go queen takes, takes, queen g5, and you just can't stop me getting in, um, not without losing your d pawn anyway. Um, so that's one way and um, after queen d5 um, I go rook f6 now this one's slightly diff di more difficult to understand uh, but actually these threats against the uh, king side force black to um, uh, to uh, to well to do some something uh, drastic and swap off queens and then actually um, white's just got well quite a few different ways to play for the win this was the most um, elegant we're pinning this uh, this bishop on c5 we're going to end up winning it with uh, something like uh, uh, like bishop b4 quite apart from the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, this pawn on a6 is hanging and the black king is rather weak and exposed to an attack so um, yeah you know I mean that was again the best thing and it's it, it's just uh, uh, really you know this move f takes e6 this forced a, a, probably you know you'd say a slight shift in perspective from white about uh, attacking target and those are things that are very hard to uh, uh, to get prop to, to to understand properly in the heat of a battle in this tension when you're getting short of time um, and uh, yeah, it's only in the calm of your study and with the help of uh, uh, plenty of engine games that you understand what it's all about. Um, yeah, bishop g5, rook f8, bishop f6. Actually, this turns out to be um, not the best uh, idea simply because now it's, you know, with the way that, um, that the white pieces have, uh, have got, it's just really hard now to, to target this pawn on g6. Um, actually, the only thing that these pieces can really do is attack this pawn on d4. 
Um, and uh, well, you know, looking at that, you sort of feel well. The only thing that black that white has got in this position is a sacrifice on on d4, an exchange sacrifice and breakthrough. Um, but somehow this bishop on f6 is kind of shielding the uh, the black king. It's really weird. And um, and but this was a, um, a moment now where um, where black made um, a, a really big mistake. And uh, um, obviously, yeah, time must have been uh, definitely played an issue here. Um, actually, rook c3 was the um, uh, was the uh, the best move that black had. And you just start off exchanging off um, uh, white major pieces. Um, and yeah, you know what does white do? I mean, if you if you take on d4, this feels like uh, something decent. You know, you're uh, uh, getting access maybe to d6, d7. There's actually a couple of ways of playing. This was the most striking. It was rook f6 takes and king f7, and uh, you know basically the, that black king is is kind of safeish, um, and all, also ready in the end game to to take the pawn on f6. So um, uh, this was just um, uh, equal apparently. Uh, you know the f6 pawn acting both as a shield for uh, for black's king and also as a weakness uh, in the future end game. Um, yeah, um, if you go rook takes c3, uh, then there was uh, an, an amazing resource. I mean, this move queen d5. If you go rook c3, then I've got bishop takes f2 check, takes queen e5, and this pin is uh, uh, giving black uh, everything that he wants. And if you go to king h2, I've got this uh, great move, bishop d6, e takes, takes. And, um, well, yeah, you probably have to visualize as well that this is all holding. Why is it holding? It's holding because uh, having queen on c1, the queen is attacking this pawn on h6. And, uh, well, queen e7 was one idea. Uh, check queen g7 here with, uh, with a draw. So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, actually, it's just uh, um, this move, bishop g5 to f6. It just doesn't hit the spot in terms of, you know, where are the weaknesses in black's king side. But that was very, it was very hard to spot the, uh, the correct way. The problem was, was that uh, Conero played the move queen d5, which really just walks straight into really the only attacking idea that white's got left, which is rook takes d4. And uh, yeah, this is very, very strong. You're doing it with tempo. And uh, yeah, to keep hold of this uh, e6 square is pretty tough. I mean, if you go queen c6, I just go rook d6, takes, takes. And I've got all sorts of threats like uh, rook takes a6 and rook to e7. So um, not good for black, this one. So uh, Kunero again played the, I think the only move that you would play in a human game, queen a2. And, you know, you're sort of, putting threats like rook takes f2 into the uh, equation. Well, rook d7 was played, and we're looking for uh, a little rook g7 takes g6 or something like that. So rook f6 was played, had to play it to give to give it up, and queen a1 check, forking the uh, pawn on h6 and king on g1. King h2, and now Conero found a, a beautiful idea, really tricky idea, queen e5, with check. Just asking white, what are you going to do? Um, are you going to play, uh, well, you're not going to play the move g3 most likely because we take on f2 with check. But are you going to weaken your king with f4, give me uh, just a little bit more attack against g2? Or are you going to try and keep the king safe? And um, yeah, just, uh, um, I don't think there was a 40 move time control, but this was the 40th move. You always think of that somehow. And uh, yeah, him, Muzichuk made um, uh, probably the, the, the the, could have been the most costly mistake in the uh, in the game. Played the move king h3. Um, f4 was the way to do it. Queen f6 check and rook a7. And yeah, these threats against the back against the back rank are just too much. King g8. We go rook a6. Rook a2. Rook e6. It's just all falling basically, you know. And uh, um, yeah, so I mean that was uh, that would have just been uh, the way to do it. But Muzichuk played king h3. And now, actually, amazingly, the move, not queen f6, which is what Conero played, but rook takes f2 would have held. Um, because the white king is, is so weak here, that, uh, uh, and there's no threats that white has got that, can, um, th th that, uh, that white can you know, sort of uh, complete with only the rook. And if the queen moves away, then, yeah, what can you do? Um, so, for example, a rook d8 check, rook d7, queen c4, we just go queen e3 check and you're just not going to be able to get out of the perpetual so yeah again Conero was so desperately close 
to um, to, uh, uh, to to making the draw and winning the match. You know, it was really on those tiny little moments. It was uh, just incredible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very easy to uh, to look at Rook F2 and say, ah, easy draw uh, when you're here sat in your study. But um, yeah, in the, with the tension of the game, short of time. Yeah, Queen F6 played. And now it's very similar to the lines we've seen before. You know, just uh, shout out to this pawn on H6, which is killing this king on h8 you know and uh forces the rook back to c8 queen e4 and we're in total control i mean uh, any rook endings are just going to be phenomenal for uh for white and uh well the queen and rook one's pretty good too you know so um queen g5 played here going after the h6 pawn but then queen h4 you know again musichuk judging perfectly that uh, the exchange of queens is all that you need in this position to make it hopeless um, so some, for example, something like queen g4 check takes rook a7, a5. Don't even bother about my pawns because I've just got this rook check. Um, I've got this uh, this outpost on g7, and then I just end up uh, uh, going rook h7. And uh, well, there we are. I'll uh, just do whatever I want to uh, queen the pawn, rook c8 check, and uh, an a8 queen. So, um, yeah, this pawn h6, it just pins the black king to the back rank, which makes any rook ending with a, a, a pass extra a pawn just completely winning. So Cunero played uh, queen f8, but um, there was no coming back from this, uh, unfortunately for her. And uh, Muzichuk put this away with, um, yeah, just uh, uh, some very accurate and, uh, and uh, difficult play. Rook f7, queen c3, queen d7, and uh, black resigned. Um, yeah, well, what threat haven't we got in the position? There's just too many. I mean, it was a wonderful fighting game, you know, by both players under you know, desperately tense uh, circumstances. And, um, you know, but what I was really impressed about, I mean, uh, in terms of fighting spirit, I was amazed many times that Cunero didn't just collapse and kept on finding resources and could have escaped, you know, at, uh, at various moments if just, yeah, life had turned for her at, uh, at that moment. Um, but I think, you know, what I was really most impressed about was um, the way that Muzichuk um, built up the position in, um, uh, in this must-win situation. And in particular, this uh, concept of B3 and A4 um, was really, really beautiful and, uh, you know, a perfect way of playing um, in a must-win situation. And, uh, yeah, you know, there, there, are, there are great must-win games and, you know, for me, this is definitely one of them because... Uh, um, yeah, it, it was just uh, absolutely perfect. It gave White exactly what she wanted, and the rest is in the lap of the gods, you know. So um, yeah, those were the um, uh, the second and the fourth games from that uh, candidates uh, quarterfinals. We're going to have a look uh, at a few more in um, uh, in the uh, uh, in the subsequent videos because actually, uh, I think pretty much all of the games in the match were really worth uh, worth seeing. It was a really high quality and. Uh, and uh, dramatic encounter. So uh, hope you enjoyed that. Sorry for the slightly long video, but I hope it's been uh, instructive. If you want something against the Petrov, have a look at these uh, games and the videos that follow, because uh, I think um, yeah that in this match uh, Muzichuk really showed a lot against uh, against that opening. There we are. Thanks very much for watching. If you fancy subscribing to the channel, giving this video a like, or taking a look at my new book and chessable course, The Silicon Road to Chess Improvement, then give it a go. Thanks very much for watching.